One of the, the big parts of this lifestyle, this passion, this little niche of this thing that we have, and that driving passion for me is to make sure that every time I, I, I put the waders on or I step foot anywhere, anywhere there's water, I'm there to learn something. No matter what happens, I'm there to learn something. There's always something there to learn. There's always a variable that you can figure out no matter what it is, no matter where you go. I travel a lot to fish as well, and that's one of the things I love to do. I love going to a place with zero info, stepping in there, and just trying to learn as much as I can about it. And if you catch a fish, even better. Welcome to the Surfcasters Journal Night Fishing Podcast. Our mission is to share our passion of surf fishing by bringing you interviews and conversations with some of the sport's most fascinating people. I am your host, Zeno Roman, co-founder of Surfcasters Journal Magazine at surfcastersjournal.com, book author, and of course, an avid surfcaster. So let's jump right into today's episode. Today is my pleasure to introduce... John Johnson, he is a surf caster. He is a former executive chef of Four Seasons. He is a ODM brand ambassador, a dad. He, he wears a lot of hats. Let's just put it that way. Welcome to the show, John. <laughs> Zeno, thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here and an honor to be here with you. All right, so you tell me, how does the guy that's one day in a Hallmark channel doing cooking videos for Thanksgiving and next day he's up on his surf with the regular guys, that, that's that got to be a hard thing to pull off. Not, and I'm not saying uh, being on television and, and cooking, but I know that your job is more stressful and hours are a lot harder than most other people. So how, how do you manage to do both? Yeah, you know, I think it just it comes from uh, you know the the mindset of of having a, a passion for doing something different, something that not everybody else out out there gets to do all the time. Being a chef is is very much like that. It's a different profession. It's not for everybody. Uh, it's a very challenging, very stressful, but also very rewarding uh, uh, career, and, and it takes a lot of passion and a lot of uh, a lot of drive to be to be good at it. And, and it takes a lot of years to. A lot of experience, much like surf casting. Yeah, I mean, but most of us, you know, get the whole night, uh, the pleasure of fishing most of the night. On most nights, you, on the other hand, get to work most of the nights uh, until late. I, I actually heard that that one night you drove after your shift all the way to the canal, which is like a, a five hour ride. Yeah, that well, that was that's just one. You know, um, fortunately for me, uh, a lot, a large part of my career. I kind of been in areas where um, where I also love to fish, or been been close to areas where I love to fish. You know, I love to travel and fish. It's one of the big things that uh, that that I love to do. And being uh, working in Manhattan for many many years, I mean, sky was the limit. You know, it's an easy easy run to Montauk, uh, anywhere in the South Shore, and North Shore, uh, anywhere in Jersey, uh, and also up to New England. It's it's it actually shortens you know shortens the trip and it's kind of a central hub. And uh, it was actually easier for me to commute to fish. Um, for, for so many years from there. So uh, it actually created more opportunities, believe it or not. Yeah, but I mean, the hours are rough. Uh, I was just referring to, you know, getting out at midnight or one o'clock and then going fishing. And then, you know, <laughs> when most of the people get up, you know the deal. But, you know, is there any parallels between cooking, uh, being a chef and, and, and surf fishing? Yeah, I, you know, you, you hit the nail on the head, um, you know, with the hours thing. The hours is a... Uh, that's a big thing. We're used to being on our feet for hours and hours on end. Um, you know, we, we, we kind of operate in that in that off off peak times, uh, to, you know, just like us as surf casters do. Uh, we're, we're up before everybody else and we're out there after everybody else in the ungodly hours um, and, and ungodly temperatures and seasons. And, and that's, in a chef's mind, it's, it's, it's a very similar thing. Um, you know, fortunately, my business kind of um, gravitates to offer me time in the fall. Uh, and in the early spring, my favorite time of the year, um, to chase, chase trophy fish, um, you know, here, here in Jersey and the Raritan. Uh, so it's actually, uh, you know, it's just, it's always been a part of my life. I've always made sure that I have time to fish. If I wasn't able to have tough time to fish, then I probably would have changed careers a long time ago. I know that when we go to the fishing shows in the winter time, you guys are already into the fish and, you know, back bays and stuff like that. And you guys have a really, really good fishery really, really early, right? So is this the same as when you say trophy fishery in the spring or is it slightly different? Yeah, it, you know, it really is the same. Um, 
you know, growing up, I grew up here in Jetty Country uh, in Monmouth County in, in New Jersey. You know, I started fishing the typical way, uh, chasing snappers at the Shark River Bridge. Uh, you know, and, and from there it stemmed into riding my bike to the three tackle uh, shops that I could get to, which were uh, Fisherman's Den and Belmar. You know, we'd, we'd go there and, and uh, Sportsman's Shop in Neptune City. You know, go there, ride my bike there. You know, bombers were, I think, three for twelve ninety nine back then, something like that. And uh, a very good friend of mine uh, back then, I met a gentleman by the name of Chris Mauser, uh, sort of my mentor, uh, got me into freshwater fishing. Then he would tell me these these stories about, um, you know, big stripers and, and off the jetties in, in, in Monmouth County for, you know, in the old days. But um, for me, when I started, it was it was really difficult. You know, it was uh, I, I literally started surf casting almost the same year that the moratorium started um, at the federal level for for striped bass and uh, striped bass really didn't exist, particularly here in New Jersey. And uh, it was a very, very tough time to try and cut your teeth in surf fishing because really all we had was bluefish, um, you know, at that time. It was uh, an amazing bluefish fishery. And, you know, we really just uh, we were out there with our, our heavy boot foot waders, a PVC rain jacket, uh, surplus canvas bag from the Army Navy store and, and the belt and a few bombers, a Hopkins and, and stuff like that. That's that's really where it all started for me. Uh, I would say around 80. 6 87 something like that um and you know before i had my license obviously uh we would just jump jetties and uh here in here in monmouth county and uh, chris introduced me to a gentleman from the asbury park fishing club named russ ewing and russ was a local legend uh, i mean he had big fish under his belt for so many years won tournaments um you name it throughout the 60s 70s and 80s with the asbury club and uh, introduced me to him and uh we spent a lot of time in Russ's garage, just listening to his stories, hanging on every single word of the history of, of striped bass fishing here in Jetty Country, and uh, that's really where my, my passion for chasing chasing stripers and big trophy stripers, particularly in the spring, uh, originated. And uh, you know, I started reading and reading because you just didn't see these fish for years, and it really surf fishing um, jumped off for me. You know, we had, we would go out two or three in the morning and, and fish in the dark, freezing cold in, in October, and November, and just push through the night, fish the first light. Then we'd go get coffee and then we'd head home or I'd head to football practice at school or whatever it was. And uh, one morning we were in Spring Lake next to the flume, the first jetty in Spring Lake. Um, it's kind of a legendary bass spot. Um, many, many 50 pounders came from there in the 70s and, and 60s and 70s. And uh, so we always fish those, those jetties. And one morning, it, it finally sank in for me, um, you know, the entire horizon literally exploded in Armageddon, looked like bowling balls dropping out of the sky from an armada of bombing, bomber planes. And it was just an absolute mayhem of giant bluefish blitz. And they were coming into us right in the corner of the jetty where we were. And I was casting and casting and not not catching anything. I couldn't, I couldn't hook up. I just, I just didn't have, you know, didn't have the right retrieve. And he looks at me, he's like, you better speed it up, boy, you better speed it up. And, uh, I cast my, my Hopkins out and I, I, I cranked it as fast as I could. And I hooked into my first giant gorilla bluefish. And we caught so many bluefish that day that just my arms felt like they were going to fall off. Uh, I think I missed football practice. I got in trouble with my football coach at the time. And, uh, from there on, it was it was over. Um, you know, that was all I dreamed about, all I thought about, and uh, that's where my passion really um, it ignited my passion um, for, for surf fishing, being out of the jetty, you know, just learning the tides and the winds and where to be in the right place in the right time. And then later on, you know, I really, uh, from from my log and my experience, um, the fishery was was not great when it's when I first started. Um, obviously for, for everybody, it was very tough to even catch a striped bass, let alone a big one back then. Um, but I fished hard through the late eighties into the nineties and we saw it start to come back. I got my license and then I could travel and expand my range. And, uh, me and my friend Greg, we would, we would travel up to the Raritan. We'd hit all the spots in the Raritan. And at that time we had them all to ourselves. And, uh, it was, uh, you know, we had an amazing fishery that sprouted, but really nothing big at that time. And it was really all kind of geared towards the fall. Um, but we kept at it and we traveled further and further, expanding our range down to Island Beach, Seaside, um, and fishing as much around as, as we could. Um, and then we found out that, you know, bigger fish started to show up in the mid to late 2000s. And this was before 
I got on social media or any of that, that kind of stuff. And it was still kind of a very, very quiet um, fishery back then. And uh, boy, did it explode. I mean, the big fish started to show up in good numbers and we would get on them regularly. And uh, it was just, that was, that was where I really started to see it. When you start seeing results like that and you start putting things together, you really dial in and try to focus in on the variables and, and the details that can put you in the right place at the right time. And uh, in the past, I would say 10 years and even down to the last three years um, where the fishery has tapered off, um, having that experience and dialing in those variables and, and putting them in place in the spring has paid off big time for me. And, you know, having a really tight um, group of, 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 of people that I fish with um, has also been really helpful because we rarely see anybody out when we're out, but we, uh, our numbers and, and quality have increased over the past five years tremendously. So it's exciting. You know, one thing most people don't know about me and mine and your tra trajectory at least seem the same because I came to this country in 87 and I started ah, yeah. fishing as soon as I got here. And let me tell you something, it fucking sucked. <laughs> <laughs> it took me years to uh, get a bass. Okay. The first bass that I ever caught, and I don't think I ever told this story. The <laughs> first bass I ever caught was a Jones Beach field. Six. I'm talking about keeper, Pat, because yeah. the keepers were not, not sure. uh, very few and far between. I stuck, I think a straw down the eel's uh, mouth uh, to keep him straight because I fished it, believe it or not, on a sinker. <laughs> and that's, and I, I, I think I went to take a piss and the rod went down and I was chasing him through the water. I mean, this was so embarrassing, but this is what it was. So I, I can relate when you say bombers, Adam blogs, uh, you know, uh, Hopkins, that was basically what I used to. And also the, the Jersey blitzes that you mentioned, I remember this was in the days of the Stripers Online being the most popular set. I'm sure it still is. I don't go on it, but I'm sure it still is. Uh, and I always said, and I said this to the guys at Cape Cod Canal a few years ago, not because I'm a genius or smart ass, but these things tend to end. And when the Jersey guys had those bunker blitzes for a few consecutive summers, I mean, it looked like you just had to show up on a right jetty and catch your gigantic fish and take the picture, and this was never going to end. And guess what? It ended. Uh, it was nice while it lasted. I, it, all I'm saying this is as a warning for anyone to think that everything, anything's going to last for life, lifetime. And I'm looking at it this morning, the Bitcoin's at $60,000. That's not going to last either, okay? <laughs> so, so just so you know, but when you say, when you say Jersey, uh, a stripe, a Jersey spring bite, like, is, is the Jersey spring bite for the trophy bite different than when you start off in a in a back of Raritan and a back bays? Is it a two different bites or is it the same bite that just kind of gets better? Well, you know, it's uh, the one thing I've learned from from uh, from reading and from having a really uh, good close group of friends is that, you know, we keep our information very tight. And As you should. We, 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 we tend not to chase a, a bite, so to speak. Um, but we like to talk about all the variables that are going to put us in these very tight, small windows around the moon with the right tide, with the right bait. For me, for me, the, the biggest thing that's paid off, and this is not really an earth shattering secret, um, but it does take a lot of time and some, some nasty weather. But this time of year, before things start really get going in February, even um, I, I scout extremely heavy and I go and look at all the places that are produced for me and I try and pinpoint the bait as I get closer to the to my moon and tide windows that I like and that's where I'm going to put myself and I'm not going to go chase the phone call bite that might be happening in a, in a very well-known place um, because those, those are typically going to be the, the school fish um, I want to I want to put myself where I'm not going to be around anybody and I have a shot at, at these bigger fish and that's really that's really what's been paying off from for the past four years, you know, for myself. But it takes a lot of time and a lot of a lot of walk on the beach. I try to pick a tide where or a day where there's a, a wind that that pushes the tide way way out, right around the moon, and the, and the bay will almost dry up, and it becomes this giant solar panel that soaks up sun throughout the day, and then the tides will come in. And if you put the bait in that same place, in the right place the big fish will show up on those warm flats in the evenings and through the night and into first light. That's typically kind of the formula that I like, that I like to use me and me and my, my, my close, my close group. And 
I, I tell you, I, I can't stress it enough. The scouting alone, uh, it just absolutely has increased everything across the board uh, in terms of quality of fish. So you consider yourself a student of the game, I assume. I mean, at least that's to sound sounds to me uh, like that's something that you do. You also keep a log. Yes. Uh, so a very detailed log. Um, I, I can figure that one. <laughs> being, being a student of the game, I think you know, as you well know, there's always one of the the big parts of this lifestyle, this passion, this little niche of this thing that we have. And that driving passion for me is to make sure that every time I I, I put the waders on or I step foot anywhere, anywhere there's water, I'm there to learn something. No matter what happens, I'm there to learn something. There's always something there to learn. There's always a variable that you can figure out no matter what it is, no matter where you go. I travel a lot to fish as well. And that's one of the things I love to do. I love going to a place with zero info, stepping in there and just trying to learn as much as I can about it. And if you catch a fish, even better. But you know, just to be out there, uh, that for me, that's 99% you know, to 100% of it, um, just to be able to unplug from your stresses or worries or unpaid bills or whatever it is, pandemics, um, you know, just uh, to get your head out on the edge, feel the salt air in the dark, you know, the heave of the surf, that's all I need, you know, to catch on top of that even better you know that that's amazing too but that, that that for me is really what it's all about and i like to keep people around me that you know that that's what it's all about for them and we just have such a great time you know and and we like to chase big fish yes absolutely but when you do that you got to take a lot of there's a lot of a lot of shifts you're going to put in that uh are not going to produce as well so it's uh it's it's always about being a student of the game for me always if i ask you um uh, what place do you put yourself to what is your perfect place and conditions to be in and i i don't mean in terms of of uh where you want to fish every day but like you know where do you want to fish the most under what conditions so i mean if you told me cape cod canal during a squid bite that's fine but like where do you feel what do you, what gets you the most excited during a winter to think to be at you know, I think it's um, it, there's there's two things. You know, growing up in jetty country, obviously, I'm most comfortable on a jetty, on a heavy outflow, on a dangerous rock somewhere with some big tides, big waves, and big wind. You know, that that's always gets me jacked up because all the variables are at play: the danger, the mystique, the unknown. You know, all those things heighten your senses and and you tune into everything that's in front of you. Um, you know that, but. Just the chance, you know, every time I set foot uh, on the water, my expectation is that next cast is going to be that 50-pounder. It's going to be that fish of a lifetime. And every single cast I make, I have that expectation. And, you know, I just I feel that way every time I go. It's going to happen. This is the time. It's going to happen. And that keeps me going. Um, so the ideal situation, yeah, I'd like to be, you know, uh, on on a jetty somewhere with you know big waves, big tides, and you know with a shot at a at an absolute giant, um, is you know that's where I'd love to be, um, ideally. And, and growing up in, in in jetty country, that's probably my 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 most favorite place. I'm, I'm hopeful that they come back, uh, you know, this year out front like it was, um, but also fishing you know in the back bay and and like the Raritan for example, you know if you know if you know the right tides and the right windows. My favorite winds and my favorite tides, you know, to be in in the spots that I really love in the Raritan, um, that has a special place in my heart too, because that, that's just, you know, it's just it's part of me. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear you, and uh, you know, I think most of us uh, gravitate into certain places. There's certain fantasy places where we'd like to be, but you know, for the most part, it's places that we spend a lot of time, and there's a reason why we spend a lot of time on it. Uh, and what is what's in your bag like i know there's conditions that require different plugs but just give me like give me an idea of what's in your standard bag that you can't live without because obviously if you go to fish a flat back bay area you're not going to have anywhere near plugs as you're going to angry ocean kind of surf but tell me what 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 is it what is that you have the most confidence in okay so <laughs> in, in recent years even before you know i was always uh have a, a a big passion for swimming metal lips um but recently my biggest producer my biggest confidence plug has been the big the large size like three ounce plus wood darters and 
it sounds a little off center to say that because they fish a lot of back bay and even the stuff out front where we get on the big fish it's not deep fast moving water but if you hit them at the right tides with the right plug that displaces a lot of water and i'm not fishing really heavily weighted darters um, my, my biggest confidence plug is an ls69 uh, charles carlo yellow blind AC, uh, ayc darter and that that plug i have in my bag has more 30 and 40 pound plus fish on it than anything else that I own. And, and of course, it's a lot of confidence, but I found that with the right conditions, um, I dress it with a uh, just a, a flag on the back and a single belly hook. And I find that that helps keep it in exactly the right water column where, where I'm fishing with the right tide and the right sweep to just absolutely be in the strike zone for these big fish. So I tried to experiment with that and expand that out to other, uh, other wood darters like the Beach Master, of course. That's always in my bag. Um, uh, as well as Mike's Commander. Mike's Commander is a, a metal lip that I have huge confidence on. It's always in my bag. Um, his daughters as well. And of course, the mighty Super Strike. You know, the Super Strikes, <laughs> I have more Super Strikes in my bag than anything else. I, I'd be lying if I, if I, if I, if I said I, I didn't. But uh, one thing that I found with the Super Strike daughters as well is to uh, dress them with either this very small dress side wash on the back uh, and a single belly hook and that gives me a little bit just enough lift to, to be able to fish it in a little less sweep but in a skinny water situation where it also puts it right in the right column and i've seen it I've, I've been out produced on it my buddy mike zauchek um right next to me outfished me four to one two nights in a row on that plug and i said man there's something to it and uh i started applying that to, to the wood darters and to the super strike darters um you know that's all those are always in my bag any and all in in some shape shape or form of yellow or combination of yellow because predominantly our forage bait is going to be adult bunker in the spring, um, so yellow is always a color that I have um, at all times, um, and as well as the uh, you know the, the, the large mag darter is one plug that is always in my pack as well. Uh, I fished that plug for a year or two, could not get a tap on the plug, and I committed to fishing it for one year. And I figured out that if I fished it <clears throat> a little bit different, instead of just casting it out and fishing it like a regular darter, I cast it out and I fish it actually like a jerk bait. And I put a lot of almost like a like like you would for a spook, but in a downward. I'm a right-handed, so it's right upper right sweep down to my left hip motion to get it dug in and started, and then I'll I'll hit it with that with a slow retrieve and pause. And that large mag darter. Once I started doing that, um, it was it was lights out. So th that's. That's kind of a you know kind of the basics. Those are always in my bag. A loaded red fins always in my bag, of course, and my black bomber. I go I don't go anywhere without that. And um, to stay true to my my old school Jersey roots, um, I always have some tin squids um, in the pouch. Um, you know some small three quarter to, to one ounce bucktails, of course. And uh, you know the soft plastic craze has has exploded this year. Uh, so I plan on having a lot more of those in my bag this year as well. Um, but you know like gravity eels and. BKDs and stuff like that, um, but it's all about that big profile and getting it in the right column. And I think it's it's a very fine line between nothing and just absolutely being in the right zone, in the right tide, in the right window um, with that offering in, in the spring for for us here. I gotta say, I'm surprised by your choices. Not not that they're bad choices, it's just that uh, not not a lot of people gravitate to big daughters as a first choice. That's first. Uh, and the second thing is the big Mac dot. I never really took off like its smaller cousin that came out first, which is which is a really really good plug. Yes, it is. Uh, and they're both good plugs. Like like you just prove it to all of us that you just have to use it until you figure it out. And and I I got a feeling that you are very creative with stuff that you do because uh, generally the people that are students of the game and um, are keeping the logs are like to. Uh, play with different things until they see what works and this is why you go and and see the the areas before you fish them plus i've seen the way you lay out your food i, I know you're very creative <laughs> <laughs> we all know i mean we're not talking about some regular guy in a deli we're talking about a world-class chef here <laughs> um all right so and the other thing is you are the brand ambassador for the odm company right or the rods they make the surf back they make plugs they make but they're most famous for the rod line and that has come a long way from 
few years that they started, I mean, it's a really remarkable what they have accomplished. Obviously, you're a big part of that. What do you think it's the secret to the success of, of the ODM company? You know, I think it's it's uh, it, it it goes back to our passion for this fishery. It, that's really where it originates from. You know, if you know Steve, um, Steve's a, a, a very he, he's one of my best friends in the world. Um, I've known Steve for for a bunch of years now. When he when he first started, I met him and I said, "Man, this guy has something really special." And you know, he has this passion for. If you know Steve, you know he's he's not going to put out anything that is uh, at a hundred percent. He's going to put out stuff that's at a hundred and ten percent. You know, every detail. How does how does the rod react? How does it feel? How does it cast? How does it look? What's its durability? Does this do what the angler fishing it? wants to do. And I think that theory and that sort of uh, approach is in every single product that we create and, and put into the market um, with Steve's vision um, for creating, you know, this this ultimate experience. Um, it, it's in every single thing, every thought process that we do, we pour over every single thing that we do before it ever even attempts to get into the market. And I think that really, it shines through in the product, it speaks for itself. and you know, I just enjoy um, the, the the full range of everything we do. We have something for everybody, as you know. You know surf fishing, it, it's it's all about preference, right? We're we're constant tinkerers with all of our gear and and customizing this and making that and inventing this and that. Um, and it's really it's born of that same mindset. And and it has to be an excellent product. It has to be something that's a um, you know just that next level of experience for the surf caster and, and something for everybody. You know, some people like, like me, I've, I've got a bad shoulder and, you know, I need, I need, I'm not, I'm a terrible caster. Um, so I need something. Welcome to the club. My <laughs> so I need as much help as I can get in that respect. But I look, I look more for the sensitivity so I can feel what my black bomber is doing in that skinny water to know that I'm in the right place at the right time. And, and, you know, the ODM products have, have you know, that's put me in the right place. And, and, you know, we just, we love what we do. We're passionate about this this fishery, um, for, for all types of fish, but striped bass, of course, is our our, our pride and joy. And uh, it's all about the pursuit of the ultimate experience, trying to build that into everything that we do. I I screwed up my shoulder in the gym uh, as I joined the gym at the late ages <laughs> of fifty, and you, my friend, what fell off the bike and screwed up your shoulder? Yes, sir. Yep. Uh, right. <laughs> That but, was hey, a brilliant but, idea. Well, at least we're be at least we're trying to be healthy, right? Yeah, I, I think that's the pursuit of our uh, youth, which <laughs> left me about thirty years ago. So <laughs> I'm a little behind on that one. <laughs> Listen, I, I I've seen you at the shows, and I know that you enjoy working with them. And obviously, all of you guys that help out of these shows for all these brands, it's not like any of you are paid employees. This is all like a labor of love, and you know you have to believe in brand, but. How do you tell a guy who comes to you at the show and go like, okay, like I want to get a rod. And this is, this is a lot of time from the new guys to getting into sport. This is the question is like, I want to get a rod. How long should it be? Um, how do you talk him? How do you put him in a right product? You know, I think it's uh, my first approach whenever I, uh, and it, it happens more often than you think, even at shows or not at shows. And that's what I love about it too. You know, you get to, to speak to people that are kind of getting started in, in surf casting and fishing. Um, and it's really, you know, it's, it's fantastic. It's one of the most rewarding things is being able to teach and, 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 and people getting into the sport uh, and, and get them on the right path. Um, but, you know, I, I often start with where, where are you fishing? What do you like to throw? And I always tell people, you know, okay, you're getting ready for a night out in the surf what's in your bag? You know, what, what, what's your situation? You're going to be on a jetty. You're going to be on a sand beach. Um, you know, fortunately we have something for everybody and, and certain rods are the ultimate beach rod. Certain rods are the ultimate casting eight, eight and a bunker, eight ounces in a bunker head. Um, you know, we have pretty much everything to cover the gamut. So once you get someone's preferences, you can kind of say, okay, you know, I recommend this range and you know, what are you going to throw? You know, I'm throwing, SP minnows, small mag darters, three quarter ounce bucktail. That I'm going to say, all right, well, here's your range. This is this is the, you know what we offer in that in that category, and and feel for yourself. What do you think? And I, I always tell people as well, um, try and visit your local shops as much as possible. 
you know, there's so much information to be had and not just talking about like, oh, there's a hot bite here and there, but the, genuinely speaking, I know that the, the shops by me that I've always dealt with for many years, um, they're always there to help and they'll throw a reel on the rod for you to, you know, let you feel it and, and, and get a, an idea of what you're getting into before you go ahead and make a purchase. And uh, I think those are the two biggest things, just finding out what people like to throw. You know, to know what they're going to be, what the range is, where they're going to be fishing, what the application might be. You know, I'm not going to sell a, a, a seven six back bay one piece to somebody who likes to, you know, soak clams or bunker heads in Island Beach State Park. You know, but uh, you know, there there is something for everybody. That's the beautiful thing about surf fishing in general, um, and to be able to to work with products that kind of represent every single aspect you could approach within this within this um, within our sport. I, I agree with you 100%. And I also think there's a certain amount of, um, I don't even know how to describe, I, I'm going to, I'm a, I'm a simpleton, so I'm going to say the love for the product, and I'm not even going to say the brand, but the actual, the way the product feels. Like, I'm a very sloppy caster. Everybody knows that. I, I try the fast action rods, and, you know, they cast a mile as long as you have the proper technique and actually less effort than a slow or medium, whatever you want to call it. But the problem is if you don't pay attention, your cast goes about six feet. It doesn't go anywhere because the, 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 the rod's not as forgiving as, as the other one. So where I'm going with this is that, you know, I'm a big Genesis guy. I've been using Genesis for years. I take it to Mexico. I take it to Montauk. I find that rod to do everything that I want to do. It, it, it forgives a lot of my mental errors and physical errors. And I, I, I can accomplish what I'm trying to accomplish. it. And I know other people are much more into maybe a faster action rod uh, or for, you know, for, for that reason or for other reasons. Uh, I do understand that you guys reconfigured uh, the Genesis or, or updated, it would be the better word for, for this uh, year, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, every everything has its, has its life cycle and we like to, um, each line kind of has its, like you said, you love Genesis, you know, I, I, I love front, I love, all the different lines for what they do, you know, individually for different applications. But um, I love Frontier X. It's a little faster action. Uh, I tend to find myself out on the jetties more and, and, and out on the rock and stuff like that. So I like that that Frontier X. Um, but, you know, our new Genesis, uh, it, it has the same exact feel uh, of the original Genesis with upgraded uh, layering in the carbon, um, upgraded, um, it's, a, it's from the split, the bottom half, we, we layered in, uh, a 1K weave into the outer layer of it, and we actually have a sanded blank for a little bit updated, cleaner, uh, aesthetically, just a super sleek look. Um, new Fuji gunmetal guides, and uh, a, from top to bottom, um, it, it is just an absolute gorgeous rod, super, super light, ultra sensitive, that castability, that effortless castability is better than ever and uh I, I can't wait to to see people start using the new you know, the new genesis and just um putting fish on it because it, it yeah is... i think stevie told me it's a lighter stronger thinner version of the existing one or the Correct. original line you know and the pricing is uh, just about the same which is which is fantastic it's fantastic i would say it's just a, it's a refined updated sleeker uh version of the original genesis with all the original characteristics and if you love Genesis, you're going to love this even more. <laughs> That's cool. Now, tell me about your favorite rod. You, you were talking about Frontier, right? Like, yeah. You, why? Tell me. You know, I, it's it, a Frontier. I, I do. I am not a great caster, um, but I find that, uh, you know, I, as I said, I find myself in a lot of situations where I'm around rocks or in an inlet or a breachway or jetty, and I'm, I'm clumsy. I'm falling down. I'm dropping the rod, trying to land fish and, you know, jump down on the rocks, help my buddies land fish and stuff like that. Um, the, the, the Frontier X is just, it has that, that crisp cast that I like with faster recovery. Uh, has, it has a very, very, a much faster action because um, typically I'm, I'm fishing those situations in big current, targeting bigger fish with bigger plugs. And I like to have that extra power to end it quickly. Uh, I tend to, kind of overdrive my gear for those situations. But if I'm going to go walk the beaches with my daughter um, and teach her, and she's, she's becoming a big surf caster, she's really into it, uh, I got her, I've got her a next one because she's learning how to cast and it's a little more forgiving. 
Uh, but I'll grab my Genesis for that and I'll go walk the beaches with her. Um, but, you know, if I'm going out and I'm, I'm going to um, jump on my jetties or my breachways with my buddies, you know, up north and I'm grabbing my Frontier X because I know if I drop that down in the in the cracks of the jetty and, and fall down on top of it, um, I, I have a, you know, it's going to it's going to survive. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, listen, <laughs> that, that, that kind of an error. And, and I've learned this over the years uh, that nothing survives my weight. <laughs> <laughs> if you land it on the right way, but I get what you're saying. You're, uh, you also have a one piece. Right? I think Lou Caruso told me that the Evolutions were selling like hotcakes. What, what's so great about that particular rod comparable to others? Yeah, so the Evolution is super. I mean, it is the ultimate. Um, <laughs> the Evolution is, is sort of this. I, I don't know how to describe it, but the, the range in the Evolution is so wide, and it's such an easy casting rod. It's plush, smooth casting, very thin blank, very crisp recovery. You know, you can fish everything from small bucktails and small uh, plastics in the back bay. You can cast, you know, up to five ounces on that rod with effortless, just like you do on the Genesis. Um, and, and, you know, it also, again, it's for preference. A lot of people like that custom rod, that one-piece blank. You know, they they... they they like to fish that. Me, I, I've kind of gone over to um, two the dog pieces. Side. I love, I love, I love my, I love my one piece. Uh, but certain situations, I can't carry my gear that way, so I can't always bring my one piece. But the evolution has been such a huge hit because it really appeals to everybody, you know. And, and it has power to throw these big plugs and stop big fish, but it has that sensitivity and lightness to cast all night long. That you know, you're out there, you're putting in a full night shift, you're casting everything in your bag. You want to have that rod that's effortless, effortless casting, very thin blank. You can carry that thing all night long and cast it and cast it and cast it, and uh, and it has the power to, you know, to put those fish in front of you as well. You know, the remarkable part of our discussion right now, which probably nobody will get, only because they don't think about it. I, I just re, reprinted the Art of Surfcasting, which is now in 2021. It's Thank you. 13, 13 <laughs> 14 years old. And it was selling on Amazon for like $1,000. And, and I found the original file, printed file, and we just gave it to Amazon. They, I think they literally print one book at a time when you order it, which, which is fine. <laughs> which is fine. It wasn't done for money. I just wanted to get the price where it was. Where I'm going is something else. When I published that book, I used the Lamy GSP and I used Lamy GSP and other type of rods and centuries and the CTS and all this other mm-hmm. stuff over the years. It never dawned on me to use a two piece rod. It was like, oh my God. I mean, if somebody saw me with a two piece rod, I mean, what would they think of me? <laughs> now I own about five or six. They're all two piece rods. I have one one piece rod which is the evolution mm-hmm. and i have a bunch of genesis and, and other rods and they're all two piece and my point is this this it's not like we have gotten either old which i did in parenthesis <laughs> um and in, you know because we now can't do stuff or even the spots i take those rods everywhere where i took a one piece rod what i'm trying to get at is these two piece rods have gotten as good on action and sensitivity as the one piece rods used to be now will i argue that they are equal to nothing can be equal to one piece the the only thing not even when you fuse the two pieces into one piece it's still not the same so i'm not going to argue that argument but i'm just saying the quality of a two-piece rod over the year progressively has gotten so much good that it's very difficult to tell the difference between a one-piece rod and a two-piece rods under the normal circumstance correct yeah you know for me a big thing is especially commuting to the city um and this time of year a big thing for me is that that two-piece rod has really shined for me is that I can actually lock all my gear up inside my vehicle. And I, I literally get off the, the train or the bus, I hop in my truck, I put the rod together, I put it up on the rack, and I'm in the water in about 10 minutes, you know, and, and my gear stays safe. I love one-piece rods just as much as everybody else. Um, but if I had to rely on, on coming home and get my one-piece rod, I probably would miss out on a, on a large part of my fishing, um, you know, especially in the spring uh, when it comes to getting in the water after work and stuff like that. Yeah, I, listen, I hear you. I, I love the convenience. <laughs> I've done the same thing. I, I ran down to uh, the beach before work, and then I go to Long Island Railroad with two-piece rod. I just take it apart, it's buried in my trunk, and under the waders, and nobody sees it. With one-piece rod, obviously, I would have to go home. Now, has it happened that I made a cast and a top piece flew off with the... <laughs> yeah, it has happened. I mean, it's just, you know, it, it, sometimes it will happen. But for the most part, it, it, it's really good. 
Um, you also guys have a, a line of bags, which are well received. A lot of guys are wearing them and use them. And recently, I think your, your newest product for, for the last year was a single, uh, it was almost like uh, one of those whatever you want to do with it bags, right? Yeah, yeah, the all-in-one, the AIO bag, you know, uh, built really designed for, um, again, for that grab-and-go situation. You know, you, you're, you're at work or it's summer and there's a, a bluefish blitz, you know, down the beach. You got a couple top water plugs in there. You grab it, you throw it on your shoulder. It's got the pliers in the bag ready to go. Um, it can also be, be uh, you take the, the strap off it and you could also put that on your belt and use that for your big plugs and put that on your belt. If, you know, if you're wetsuiting, it's just kind of an add-on bag to your arsenal that you already have on your, on your surf belt. Um, you know, that was, that was kind of the idea of it. It's very versatile. Um, it is absolutely something, you know, I, I actually have, when I go and fish with my daughter in the summer, we walk the beach, you know, we could be collecting shells or fluking on the beach or trying to find some blues. Um, but the AIO bag is perfect for it. You know, it's just, uh, you don't want to carry the full, uh, the full plug bag with you. You grab that, throw it in the car, leave it in there and you can be out in the water in a matter of minutes. Um, you can also, it was also designed to kind of fit the, uh, the gulp containers for, for fluking and, and the bucktail pouch on the side. So it's just super versatile. Um, again, all in one. So you just grab and go and get out and get in the water quickly with uh, with your bare necessities. I just want to go back to rods for a second. I mean, I know that the, I think the DNA line was the the last one that was introduced. Correct? Am I wrong? Yeah. So DNA came out last uh, last year or two thousand. Right. Right. Yeah. The end of two thousand nineteen, we started to introduce it. Um, you know, the DNA was uh, just something that um, you know, again, it's a two piece. Has a, it's, the action it has a little bit of um, a little bit of genesis. It has a little bit of frontier in it, um, but it's something that um, we, we could uh, we could work a little bit more with the price point and get uh, a little bit more range uh, to you know to more people and uh, you know just a super durable custom look. Um, excellent. Right. It's considered an entry level in your lineup. Obviously, another lineup will look like it's a uh, high end, like comparable to Penn, who can't seem to make a fucking rod in twenty <laughs> years. That's worth anything. But go ahead. No, you know we don't we don't look at what anybody else does. We just look at we, what we love, right. what we like Honestly. to do, and uh, you know DNA is just another it's just another uh, a, t another piece of totally your arsenal. arsenal. No, it's yeah. just it's another piece. It's another weapon in your arsenal. Again, it's a two piece rod that you you can always have. In your truck, in your car, and if you notice in that range, we actually focused kind of way down into the smaller range, down to the seven foot six size, and uh, that's kind of you know th that's something that you could actually use on a kayak, for example, you know, or, or take it freshwater fishing, or you know, just just the range of application with DNA was the approach, um, you know, really just to have a, an excellent product that uh, you know, again, it's it's another set of preferences for a whole different you know group of people who might want just a touch faster action you know they're not looking for that uh you know lightning fast or mod fast action i should say for for frontier x and they don't want that moderate action just for genesis it, it kind of lands somewhere in between um regardless of price point it, it has a a little bit of a different feel than any of the other ones on its own and some people like that i actually love the dna it's like when it first came out i couldn't i couldn't put the rod down and i put so many big fish on that rod that it became my confidence <laughs> rod and i just fished it and fished and fished the 11 foot one to five and uh I mean, the range of it is just, it's absolutely perfect for everything, pretty much anywhere, to be honest with you. But, um, you know, that, that was our, our approach with DNA was really just to kind of give a, a something from our heart and our roots of what we made and, and give a, a very wide range um, to a different group of anglers. You know, I, I really think and I hope that we come to the day, which I don't think is ever going to happen, where you actually can try the rod before buying it because what... What you just said and, and just brought back some memories is like there's rods that people tell you, well, ah, you know, you write in Surfcaster Journal, this that you should be fishing with. You know, they have these certain expectations. And I found like certain rods from Tsunami, I think Airwave when it came out. This was years ago. This I'm talking about five, ten years ago. And I really, really like those models for specific application. And I didn't find any other brand of companies and and people were always like surprised that i would use something from let's just say tsunami or i just find if it works for you and it's a really good product and you really like the action i mean 
that's all that matters, doesn't it? Well, you know, it, it, it's that you nailed it. You nailed it right on the head. I mean, all of this stuff, all of our, our, our sport is all about personal preference, especially when it comes to rods. And, you know, we, uh, we, we, we like to, to look at every caster that's out there. We like to have something, you know, all those options for them. And, you know, the other good thing is about this, this industry, you know, we're surf casters, right? We demand something new, something better, something great. It has to be an excellent product. You know, we're out in these conditions and we like everything kind of customized to the way we want it to feel. And I think that's, you know, it, it goes a long way because a lot, there's so many great companies out there making so many great products. You know, we're, we're just fortunate to be, you know, a, a, a company involved at, at the grassroots level in touch with, with a lot of people in the industry and a lot of people who fish and, and all of our dealers, you know, and we take their feedback and we incorporate it. Um, and I think that's, you know, that it's, it's a good place. You know, our, our sport has a great future and, and it's nice to have all this, um, you know, friendly competition, so to speak, to help drive us all forward, you know? I am seriously impressed what you guys have accomplished in the last few years and, you know, the reputation that you built and it's all been done organically and, and it's all justified in my mind. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today and spending some time bullshitting about the rods and fishing <laughs> and Jersey and cooking. And I hope your shoulder heals well, and I hope you visit us again and, uh, We'll, we'll do this chit-chat about uh, another subject. Yeah, th thank you so much. You know, what, what you and, and Tommy have created there and, uh, you know, it's really given our sport a relevance that it never had. And it's given us this platform to exchange information. You know, you hear people uh, uh, talk about social media and this and that. But all of what you guys have done, your book and, and you know, all the other books out there, just gives us this platform, you know, to exchange information and get better to help the sport, you know, to help con conservation, you know, promote catch and release, um, help our industry grow as well, you know, and, that, and that's what it's all about. And, th and then there's another thing we didn't touch on, but, you know, the youth and, and the, the growth of our sport is very dependent on, on the next generation of people coming into it. And I think your publication with Surfcasters Journal and, you know, just all the online content and everything is only helping that. And I see young people, I, you know, kids getting into this and nothing makes me happier than teaching them and working with them and you know growing our sport together it's just it's a positive thing and it's just you know that's what keeps us all going you know so thank you so much for having me uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here and uh you know look forward to seeing you soon and and let's fish you know what uh that's a good idea for a podcast get like few people together to talk about how we can do better not that we're not doing bad but we could do better for the youths uh of today you know maybe we have a kind of a panel of somebody throwing out different ideas because uh you know at the end of the day that's all we're gonna have a left with that's all we leave behind you know yeah you know interesting uh, point to that and this year it got uh put on hold because of covid but uh one of the programs that i was fortunate enough to work with with team odm was uh there's a program in a local high school here tim brennan runs it it's called get kids hooked on fishing not drugs and it's an actual high school class and i think it's around the country um, but my local program, we actually went in and taught the class uh, here. And wow, what an amazing experience. You know, you have these young kids, they hang on every word you say. And we went in and we just talked about the basics of surf casting, the basics of the gear, safety, first and foremost, uh, how to read the beach, uh, tactics and, and basics and stuff like that. But they were absolutely engaged. And that's the future of our sport. You know, and I think it's important that we focus on that and grow it. My daughter, you know, she's she's 12 now. You know, she's got... Her own uh, custom next one built by Marco Perino PPW with pink wraps and you know her her reel and she's she's getting to be pretty good you know she she's got she's got a fluke she's got several bluefish on her own and on a bucktail and uh, and she's caught her first bass she's yet to get a keeper but I think this year is going to be the year but like you said you know there's a lot more conversation in that regard you know there's a lot more women coming to surf casting too which is very cool to see. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of great things happening out there, and I think it's important we keep focused on the positive side of it. You know, there's there's nothing but good stuff out there for us. I hear you. I agree with you 100. percent We are grateful that you took time from your busy day to listen to the Surfcasters Journal Night Shift Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, we would love if you would share it with your fishing buddies and leave a rating and review to whatever app you use to listen to us. Your feedback and ratings help other surfcasters discover our podcast. 
Also check out our publication dedicated to surf fishing, Surfcasters Journal magazine at surfcastersjournal.com. Tight lines and good fishing.